You're listening to the REI Marketing Nerds Podcast, the leading resource for real estate investors who want to dominate their market online. Dan Barrett is the founder of AdWords Nerds, a high-tech digital agency focusing exclusively on helping real estate investors like you get more leads and deals online, outsmart your competition, and live a freer, more awesome life. And now, your host, Dan Barrett. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's REI Marketing Nerds podcast. As always, this is Daniel Barrett here from AdWordsNerds.com. How are you, wonderful people? I hope you are well. This week, I have a really fascinating interview with Greg Dickerson. Now, if you don't know Greg, he's over at GregDickerson.com. He is a real estate developer and investor and coach. He's investing all over the Southeast U.S., uh, North Carolina, and North Virginia, the D.C. area. He started over 12 businesses in his life, and he works with investors all the way from like the very beginning to people doing hundreds of deals a year. The thing I love about this interview and the thing I really like about Greg is that he has a very rational and methodical approach to business. He can come into a business, see where the problems are, strip away all the sort of ridiculousness and get down to brass tacks and just make progress through a certain sort of methodology that he has. It's really fascinating. And he brings a really, really unique take to real estate investing and to business in general. So without further ado, let's get into my interview with Greg Dickerson from gregdickerson.com. All right. I'm here with Greg Dickerson. Greg, how are you, man? I'm doing good, Dan. How are you today? I, I'm i doing pretty well. I hurt my hip the other day, so my hip is a little sore, which makes me feel 500 years old. But other than that, I'm doing pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, where, are you, where are you at right now, Greg? Like, where are you located? Well, right this minute, uh, I am on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Uh, I live full-time in Charlottesville, Virginia, but you know, I invest from you know throughout northeast North Carolina up into the Virginia and northern Virginia areas you know throughout DC and so today specifically I'm down on the Outer Banks and I'm helping one of my uh, investors slash client with a short term vacation rental project uh, he's purchasing a house and we're going to gut it and renovate it and uh, he's going to do Airbnb so that's like a popular little model you know for vacation homes yeah that's really interesting it's so it's so wild to me that Airbnb, like even just like five years ago, Airbnb almost seemed like an impossibility to me. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't know, but like, I remember everyone being like, well, someone's going to murder someone in your house. And like, you know, (laughs) like all this stuff that people said, the reasons why it could work. And now it's like, it's such a mainstream thing. And not only that, but it's, it's this whole other sort of element to real estate investing that wasn't even a thing five or 10 years ago. It kind of blows me away. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I guess, it, you know, the idea was if you had an extra bedroom or a room over your garage or a guest house or suite or something, you know, it kind of started out that way. And then it was like, well, if you're going to be gone, you know, and you travel a lot, you know, rent your house out while you're gone. And then, yeah, it's turned into a whole investment you know, vehicle, a model, and, you know, especially in resort communities, you know, ski resorts and beach communities and the Outer Banks of North Carolina, I'm sure you're familiar with it. You're in Connecticut. Is that where you're at? Yeah. 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 So uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina is, you know, it's a, it's a barrier island off the coast of North Carolina. It's been a summer vacation destination, you know, forever. And it's a very strong rental market, you know, however it is seasonal, you know, so you've got 16 prime weeks out of the year, You know, the typical season's 26 to 28 weeks that most houses rent. But Airbnb has really expanded that into the shoulder seasons of the spring and the fall, uh, especially with the smaller properties where people, instead of, you know, getting a small hotel room, which are limited down here, uh, not a lot of hotels. You know, it's not like a Virginia Beach or a Myrtle Beach. You know, it's mostly houses. You know, now they can come down and rent a small house for for less than or the same price as a hotel room. And, uh you know, so it's really expanded the rental pool down here. And a lot of people are, you know, putting their houses in Airbnb. It used to be VRBO. So VRBO, yeah. Vacation Rental by Upper, was around before Airbnb down here. And then now Airbnb is just kind of taken off. And, you know, these houses, I mean, I'm looking at a deal today. The guy's going to pay 300 grand for it. We'll probably put 50 in it, you know, to get it just like really shiny and smoking for, for renters. 
and it'll do fifty fifty five thousand dollars a year in rent. I mean, it's it's you know you just can't get those kind of numbers anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, it's, it completely blows my mind. Let's um let's take a step back because you're kind of like you're hitting on a whole bunch of different stuff, and I think it's like you know you you're sort of a little bit different from. You know, when I, a lot of the interviews I do, there are people that are just strictly real estate investors, right? But you're kind of you're yeah. in multiple kind of aspects of this industry. So you are an investor in the, sort of the classical sense, but you're also a real estate developer. You also coach and help real estate investors. So let's kind of take a step back for a second. Tell me, like, how did you get into this space? Like, what got you started in in real estate investing or development? Like, how did you get started? Yeah, so you know, I'm a natural born entrepreneur, you know, starting as a young kid, cutting grass, raking leaves, doing whatever I could do to make a buck. I'd knock on your door. Hey, Dan, you know, my name is Greg Dickerson. I'm your neighbor. I need money. I'll do anything. What do you need done? <laughs> so, you know, that was at the, you That's know, fifth grade, sixth pitch, grade. Right yeah, such a good pitch. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was my door to door pitch. I just need to make some money. I'll do anything. What do you want me to do? You know, I'll watch your kids, wash your car, rake your whatever, you know, anything. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that's, that's how I grew up, right? Started, I mean, I was fifth grade, sixth grade. So anyways, you know, I worked in restaurants through high school. And, uh, you know, I also was a general laborer on some construction sites. There was a guy uh, doing an addition on a restaurant that I was working in, and he hired me to come clean up after him. So I'm a hard worker, and he liked me. And, and so I started working with him, you know, when I wasn't at the restaurant. Restaurants at night, you know, uh, working construction during the day. And did that for my uh, senior year of high school. And then I uh, went to the Navy right out of high school and did my four years, got out of the Navy and got back into construction again during the day in restaurants at night. I was always a two job guy because, you know, without a college education, your options are limited and were very limited back in, you know, the 80s, you know, uh, when you had to have a college degree to make any kind of a salary. So I was learning, you know, the hard way. And, uh, you know, fast forward to 1997, I moved to the Outer Banks of North Carolina and I moved here to open a restaurant. I was working as a regional director for, a restaurant chain at the time. And, you know, so I had some good management training, some good business training from the restaurants and um, yeah. moved down to the Outer Banks to open a restaurant. And I got into construction instead. And I started a little remodeling handyman company. In my first year in business, I did 250000 just me, myself, my truck and tools. And then seven years later, I was one of the largest builder developers here. We were doing $30 million a year in volume. And I started 12 other companies along the way during that seven year period, all kind of related to the construction industry, except for one or two. And, uh, you know, and then, and then that's how I got into real estate investing and development, um, you know, along the way was I used the profits from the businesses to invest in real estate and to develop real estate. And I started with flipping lots and then I started building spec houses. Then I did some commercial and I did some land development subdivisions and things like that. So it all kind of grew from there. And, you know, I made, uh, connections and developed relationships with, other investors and developers that were coming down to the Outer Banks and buying and building beach houses and uh, learned from them and, you know, did deals with them and uh, did work for them, built houses for them, remodeled houses for them and just kind of learned from them. So that's, that's how I got into it. Wow, man. All right. So there's a whole there's a whole bunch in there that I really want to ask about. So I've got two questions that are kind of things that pop up to my mind specifically. So for one, I find the whole like restaurant industry connection interesting. So like, was there anything you learned in the restaurant industry that you found ported over to real estate or that helped you in your the real estate sort of part of your business life? Yeah. So the biggest thing was leadership and management, you know, recruiting, interviewing, hiring, training, managing, delegating employees, because I was a manager. So, you know, I had employees underneath of me. So I first and foremost, I learned how to be a leader, manager, delegator, and those are my gifts. And that's how I did everything I've done so quickly. And so, so successfully was being able to be able to do that, to be a leader, to delegate, to motivate and manage others and teach others how to manage and lead. That's the first thing. The second thing was the numbers. So the group that I was with, Lone Star Steakhouses, they were really solid on the numbers. And I mean, you learned how to squeeze a nickel out of a penny. And that's what the restaurant business is all about. Very thin margins. It's all about volume. And I mean, you got to watch everything. And so our KPIs in the restaurant industry, it wasn't called KPIs. You know, it was just your numbers. We, we just referred to it as the numbers, which in the real estate industry is KPIs. Right. So we broke it down to like labor in the kitchen. Okay, labor in the restaurant. Labor is your biggest expense in a restaurant behind food. So you have to control that. So we would do labor matrices. So we'd say, you're going to do $30,000 this week in business. You can spend $5,000 in the kitchen on labor. So you had to break that down 
by the hour and write your schedule based on, you know, the average dollar per hour and number of people that you had and hours available. So just like in the real estate business where you break it down so many, you know, dollars spent to generate so many leads, to generate so many appointments, to generate so many deals, you know, breaking your KPIs down and all that. We did the same thing with food, with labor. And I mean, we broke our food down by each category of food, you know, seafood, steak, chicken, pork, you know, cheese, this, that, and the other. Yeah. And we did inventory on a weekly basis and we would go back and track our usage to our sales so that you knew, you know, hey, if we did the same sales this week as we did last week, but we used twice as much cheese, why? You know, did we sell more something that required more cheese or are we just wasting or is there theft? You know, what's going on? So I really learned how to track and run the business by the numbers, which takes all the guesswork out of everything. So those are the two major components I learned from a business standpoint in the restaurant. The other things you learn is how to operate under pressure, how to deal with people, mm. you know, how to how to interact with people, sales, customer service, you know, hospitality, all those types of things as well. Multitasking, you know, is huge. But at the end of the day, leadership and management by numbers, running a business by the numbers are the two biggest takeaways from the restaurant industry that translated extremely well into the real estate and construction and development world. That's awesome. I mean, I, it's it's the same with me. I mean, it's the thing I love about marketing is your ability to go back through a line of metrics and say like, where are we falling off and why? So when you yep. hire, which are when you're hiring, are you primarily looking for a skill set or are you looking for someone that has a certain set of like personality traits? I've gone back and forth. Like in my own business, I, I tend to just hire people who have personalities that I'm looking for because I'm always like, I can train you to do the actual thing. I mean, sometimes that's been great, and sometimes you know it, it's it's probably suboptimal. How do you think about that problem, or is it not necessarily one or the other? Well, it can be. So you know, a lot of times the, the adage is you know hire the attitude, not the skill. And in a general business where you don't need a specific skill set that's not super technical, where pretty much everything can be trained, then you hire the individual, right? You hire the attitude, you hire the individual, not necessarily the experience. And I've found a lot of times especially not so much in the restaurant industry, but in the construction industry, you know, you, you do need people that have experience and skills and an understanding. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're doing high level projects, you can't hire just anybody that has a good attitude. I mean, they got to know construction. They got to know what they're doing, yeah. you know, to build a million dollar house or to build a, you know, $5 million commercial building, you know, or to do site work and development, you know, you can't just train that, you know, in a week or two or a month. In the restaurant business, almost any position in the restaurant can be trained very quickly. So it's more about attitude. It's more about an individual that's willing to take initiative and is willing to learn. You know, you can train that and then cross train that. And that's how I came up in the restaurant industry. I started as a busboy dishwasher and I was moved into management very quickly because I had the right attitude, the right work ethic. I had no clue what I was doing, but they trained me. And, right. you know, that that works. In your business, you could probably do the same thing. I mean, there are some technical aspects and experience that you need, but pretty much everything in a marketing, especially digital marketing, you know, business, that can be learned and trained. And, uh, you know, you're not coding, right? You're not writing computer code. You're not, mm -hmm. you know, developing software. You're learning things that, that can be taught. So it all depends on the job. You know, if you need a, you know, if you need an engineer, well, you got to have an engineer with experience in education. And going back to that, you know, I've hired a lot of people in, in my career that had tremendous experience, but poor attitudes and they didn't do well and they yeah. didn't last long. And, you know, and I had people that had less than equivalent experience, but great attitudes and they did extremely well, even though they weren't quite there, but they had enough technical knowledge to where I could take them to the next level. So I'm all about hiring the right attitude over the experience all, all day long. Yeah. The other question I had for you in almost immediately was, so just to go back to this, so you said you, you started 12 different companies, right? So how yeah. many of those were like at the same time? You know what I mean? Like, are, are this was like, are you starting one and selling it and moving on? Or do you have like multiple businesses at a single time? Yeah, I had uh, at one time, probably seven or eight all at the same time. And what I do and the way I did it was I would find great operators and partner with them. So my first company was a plumbing company. So I had a remodeling business. When I first started out, we did nothing but remodeling. And I was having trouble getting trades contractors to do my work because they were small jobs. So one of my plumbing companies, was a, it was just him. And he had two trucks and he had a helper and he was struggling. And he was about to go bankrupt and leave town. 
So he's a great guy, good plumber, poor businessman. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll buy your company. I'll pay off all your debts. You run it. I'll coach you. I'll put an office manager in place. We'll grow your business. You do all my work. And you know, then we'll grow the business beyond my company. Mm. So that's what we did. I bought him, paid off his debts, put an office manager in place, got him an office warehouse. Actually, he shared mine at the time. I was still in my office warehouse at the time, my first facility. And uh, I, I went out and bought six trucks. Uh, there was another plumbing company that was going out of business. We hired all their mechanics. Instantly, overnight, literally overnight, he went from two trucks to eight, became the largest plumbing outfit on the, on the, in the area. And, you know, I'm a guerrilla marketer, so I've got a marketing, you know, that's the other thing from the restaurants that, that I took away. Plus, I'm very self-educated. I didn't go to college, but I educated myself. One of the first books I ever read on marketing was guerrilla marketing. So back then, everything was offline. There was no online marketing. So, you know, I lettered up the trucks, put full page ads in the phone book, and then we blew him up and turned him into the largest plumbing outfit on the beach at the time. And a uh, very small community. So when you do something like that, it looks like you're everywhere and you look huge. And, um, you know, so I knew how to do that. So that was one. I had my construction company at the same time. Then I added a real estate arm to the construction company, separate business. Then I did an electrical company. Then I did a storm shutter company. I did a painting company. I did a pool spa landscaping company. So I had all of those and some restaurants all at the same time. And then I did a gymnastics, cheerleading, trampoline school, another situation where, <laughs> you know, uh, I was high profile and, and, you know, I did a lot of stuff in youth sports. My kids were growing up. So I coached every sport they were in and I, I had a passion yeah. for kids and youth sports. And we didn't have a gymnastics program around here beyond parks and recs that after five years, you might be able to do a cartwheel. Right. So there was this guy that, that called me up and he, we met because I was on the board of Babe Ruth softball. And he said, man, I got this business and I'm struggling. I got 70 kids in this program and you know, you, you need to come check it out. I need help. I need to, I need to move into a bigger facility and grow this thing. So I went and checked it out and it was high quality. I mean, this dude was a junior Olympic level uh, coach. He had cheerleaders in there doing like high level stuff. Yeah. And he had this trampoline program that I had no idea that there was a competitive trampoline thing. Right. So fantastic coach, great operator, poor businessman. So I bought the program, went and bought, went and uh, leased up a 10,000 square foot space. He was in like a 2000 square foot space and uh, built it out, turned it into a gymnasium. And we're in a very small community of 30,000 people. I took him from 70 kids to 350 in less than six months. Wow. Yeah. And that was at the same time I had all of the, all of the other businesses. So we just blew that program up and then I ended up taking it, turning it nonprofit and, and all that, but, you know, donated everything to the company. So yeah, so that was another one. Are you an investor who wants to dominate your local market? Do you want more leads and deals online? Then download your copy of the Motivated Seller Blueprint absolutely free at www.adwordsnerds.com slash gift. What are you waiting for? Go to www.adwordsnerds.com slash gift right now to get your copy of the Motivated Seller Blueprint. I mean, so would you say like your your primary skill set is really you're bringing the systems and the marketing to people that are already good at what they do. They just they lack that kind of centralized business skill set. And the business oversight, yes. Yeah. So the, the business intelligence uh, and sophistication, leadership, number one, leadership, management, delegation, systems, business operations knowledge of the numbers and how a business runs because a business is a business is a business, right? It's all about the numbers. So I don't care what business you're in. It's all about the numbers in terms of the operations of the business and the financial strength of the business. Then beyond that, it's got its nuances and languages and you know tricks and trades and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, the marketing is marketing is marketing, right? So you have marketing, you have advertising. A lot of people don't understand the difference between the two. And, um, and you have branding. So, you know, understanding what those things are and, and bringing that expertise to the table. But more importantly than anything else, just being a coach and a mentor, you know, and that's what I did. I found great operators and I coached them to success and I taught them what I did. And what I learned is you, you, you have a business, you automate that business, you grow it, scale it, automate it, and you take the profits from that business and you invest it in other assets that are going to pay you for the rest of your life, you know, and that. You know, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, one of the first books I read when I launched this company uh, in 1997. And what, you know, a lot of people got real estate out of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. What I got out of Rich Dad, Poor Dad was business. 
create businesses that provide cash flow to invest in other assets. That's what I was my takeaway from Rich Dad Poor Dad. That's why I did all those different businesses, just like Rich Dad did. You know, when you read the book, he had all these different companies and he invested in real estate. Yeah. So I just did what the book said. <laughs> you know, the whole, the whole idea of like snowballing all those things together, that's like really powerful when to figure out how to make it happen. Yeah. So it was real easy. So if you're good at what you do, I would come alongside of you. And again, it was somebody who approached me. Somebody came to me and said, hey, they either already had a business and they needed help getting to the next level or just staying alive. And I saw something in them that I knew they had the potential. So I came along with them and I'd partner with them. And I, you know, I didn't work one day in any of those businesses, never set foot in the operations of those businesses. I did it just like we're doing right now in the car, on the phone, in the office, on the phone, coaching them, leading them and teaching them how to be leaders, delegators, motivators, managers, and, uh, and how to, how to run, you know, their business and scale their business. So I, I did it all through them and they just did what I told them to do. They just went out, executed and, and made it happen. So you are you are currently re- developing real estate. You're also investing in real estate and working with investors. So you're Correct. kind of touching a lot of different parts of the market. I'm curious, like what you see or feel about the housing market, specifically for investors that we're in right now. Um, I've told this story like a couple times, but last time I was in a room with a lot of bigger investors, you know, people doing a significant volume of deals. I felt a lot of anxiety about 2019 and 2020 and kind of what that was going to bring. Maybe not anxiety, but just the sense that things were tightening up and it was going to get harder for investors to find deals. What's your take on that? Both from a, you know, an investor yourself, but also dealing with students who are, you know, probably at an earlier place in their investing careers than you are. Yeah, and I've got both. So I've got some clients that are, you know, in that ten to twenty deal a year range, and I've got some guys that are in the two to three hundred deal range, you know, that I coach and, and work with. So yeah, everybody is concerned about where things are headed. It's getting harder and harder to find deals because there's more people getting in the game. You know, you have the iHouse buyers, you know, the real estate market is changing. More realtors are waking up and becoming more savvy at you know doing what investors are doing because you know they are competing with with each other so that that is is something that's affecting the market prices are inflated interest rates are cheap so that's putting you know pressure on pricing so it's getting harder to find good deals that make sense mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of new investors getting the game that are overpaying from wholesalers for flips so it depends on which end of the business you're in if you're wholesaling you know, if you're flipping and, and, you know, so yeah, it's getting difficult, but it's like anything else, you know, it's, it all has its cycles. There's always opportunity. You know, the key is consistency, knowing your business, knowing your numbers and, and sticking with it. But it is getting more and more difficult to find better deals. And what we've seen is on the wholesale side, we've seen the wholesale fees, fees climb to really huge levels. And then what's going to happen ultimately is that those wholesale fees are just going to get reduced. Mm-hmm. You know, so at the end of the day, to stay competitive, to stay in business, keep going, it's going to get back to that $5,000 to $10,000 wholesale fee on most projects because, you know, it's not sustainable to generate a $20,000 wholesale fee on a $50,000 or $70,000 house. That's just not sustainable. Mm-hmm. Those investors are buying those houses. They're not making money and they're not going to go back and do more. So you're going to run out of a buyer pool at some point. So it's just a matter of evolving and you know changing your business model and just staying current with with what's happening out there. When you talk to investors that are worried about the whole kind of venture backed i buyer, you know whether that's Open Door or Zillow Instant Offers, all these kind of big venture backed companies trying to disrupt the the you know what we would think of as the investing space, but I think a lot of people just think of as the real estate space in general. What do you say to them? Like, what, how, how do you see the investor, the, the kind of individual investor or the investor with a small team fitting into that new ecosystem? Do you think those companies are here to stay or is it just kind of like, you know, they're, they're, they're floating along on a lot of investor money themselves? I don't know. Where do you see all that going? Yeah, they're not making any money. So those companies are, you know, buying, you know, uh, a database is really what they're doing. And, you know, they they are not profitable. They're not making money. Zillow offers has lost money. Uh, iHouse buyers have lo- has lost money. Open Door is is a is a loss leader. You know, um, so they're they are looking at themselves as early stage tech startup where 
you don't make any money for a certain period, but you build this huge following, right? So, you know, the other thing too is, is that they're very inefficient and they're very linear. Okay. So they have one thing and one thing only to offer you. And if it doesn't, you know, and most of the time their offers aren't great, you know, so, and they're paying close to retail, but not quite retail. So with, if they're competing with realtors, which is really what they're after, they're really after competing with that real estate, you know, agent space. They're not really after the real estate investor because they're not able to be or become a transaction engineer. So what I would tell investors is at whatever level you're at, if you're not, if you're not already, you've got to become a transactional engineer, transaction engineer in order to stay relevant. Meaning you, you got to be more, you got to have more than one solution for your homeowner, right? For your seller. And if you're truly out there to serve people and to try to solve problems, which is what real estate investors are supposed to be doing on the residential level, solving a motivated seller, a, a distressed seller's problem, then you got to be able to offer them a number of solutions. One is I could buy your house for cash and legitimately be able to take that thing down and close. Number two, it, you know, if, if, if that doesn't work for you, then maybe we can do a rent to own or a lease option. Number three, if that doesn't work for you, I know a realtor who can list and get this house sold for you, or I'm a realtor myself. You know, so, so those are some of the options as a wholesaler that you've got to be able to, or as a real estate investor, you've got to be able to offer that, that seller and, and be in a transactional engineer that these other companies aren't, they can't be, and they never will be, and they are inefficient. So I think that's where investors are going to have the advantage is that they got to be, you know, more personal, more, you know, relational and, and more transactional based to where they've got a number of solutions for people. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's absolutely huge. And I think you really nailed, nailed it in the sense that these companies cannot replace that human element of that transaction. And it's such a big part of what investors do. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with those companies. They're definitely kicking up a lot of dust. So it'll be see like when it settles, it'll be interesting to see what everything looks like. Now, it, we didn't really talk about this beforehand. And I, I wasn't really sure I was going to bring it up. But I wanted to ask you about your coaching program specifically, because the thing that makes you and what you do interesting to me is like you have a very varied background. Right. Like, I think a lot of people in the real estate investing coaching space specifically, they have done one thing and they may be like really successful and they kind of teach the thing that worked for them. Right. So it's like, I always say, like, you know, someone's like, I'm going to show you how to win the lottery and I'm going to do that by giving you my winning lottery number, (laughs) which is like, yeah, cool. And it worked for them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that number is going to work for you. But you, you have done this a lot of different times. You've been in the business space. You know, you've been in a lot of different parts of the industry. And I think that gives you like a really interesting background. So like if I'm looking to get into real estate investing or I'm an investor and I'm early or, you know, whatever, what is your coaching process look like? Like if I want to work with you, what does it look like? Like, what do you help me do? How do we work together? That kind of thing. Yeah. So it's one on one and uh, we look at what you're already doing. So if you're already in a business, you know, we're doing something, then we help you, you know, come in and help you scale that, grow it and then automate it so that you can do some other things, you know, take the profits and invest in other assets. Because again, if you're wholesaling or flipping, that's transactional and it's one at a time, right? You know, I mean, you could do a hundred a year, 200 a year, whatever, but it's still one transaction at a time, however many you're doing in a year. So that's going to be affected with economic market cycles. So you've got to have, you know, passive income coming in from somewhere. When I say passive, you know, you've got to manage the assets that you own. So passive income can be a business. Uh, it can be real estate. It can be, you know, any, any number of things. It can be financial instruments, whatever it is, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. You need other income coming in. You need multiple streams, you know, in case of an economic event, you know, to hedge uh, a downturn in your, in your residential flipping business. So I just come alongside of people where they are, whatever business it is. And I work with people in business as well, not just real estate. I've got software companies, you know, I've got construction companies, I've got retail businesses, restaurants, I mean, any number of things. And so I was geographically limited. So I was wide in my asset base and the, the strategies that I used, right? You know, so, so that's one way to look at it. If you're geographically limited, then you, you expand your asset base and you expand the types of investments and opportunities you get into. If you're narrowly focused on one technique or one asset class, then you can go big with your market. You're going to have to go big with your market. So I just look at where people are. And what I help them do is grow and scale, automate and systemize the business they're already in. I go in, find the roadblocks, 
you know, find the, the um, you know, the barriers and help remove those so that we can, we can, you know, instantly and quickly grow that business. And then I help them automate it, put it on autopilot so that they can take those profits and reinvest into other vehicles, whether it's continuing to grow and expand the business or get into another business or get into some real estate assets that are going to pay them over time. So it all depends on where they're at. If it's somebody just starting out, you know, I tell them, look, let's, let's look at some things, study some things. Usually somebody has some idea of what they're interested in, whether it's wholesaling, fix and flip on the real estate side, you know, single family rentals, you know, one strategy isn't better, isn't the best strategy for everybody, right? Some people are more bent towards commercial and multifamily. Some are more bent towards development. Some would want to flip houses, you know, whatever it is, you know, I don't tell anybody you should do this or you should do that. What I say is whatever you're called to, whatever you feel like fits your personality and what you're drawn to right now, let's do that. Let's grow it, scale it, automate it. So then you can explore other options and opportunities once this thing's on autopilot. So that's that's really what I do, regardless of what asset class you're in, what you know investment uh, strategy you're using, whatever market you're in, or whatever business you're in. That's really what I do. And it is really cool that you know this is 23 years down the road for me and developing myself every single day as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as an individual. You know, I pour into myself every single day. I've got mentors and people that that I work with at some very high levels. I and mean, I've got people at the billion dollar level that I work with that, that mentor me. And, you know, and I work with some of the top people in the industry. So what's really cool is when I work with people, they're getting the benefit of all of that mm-hmm. through me, just like books, right? If you read a thousand books, then you're getting the benefit of every book that those thousand authors wrote. So you're literally reading millions of books when you read a thousand books or a hundred books. Because you're getting everything that they've ever learned, everything that they've ever read that they compiled into that book. Same thing with me. Everything that I do with the guys that are flipping 300 houses a year, you know, 200 houses a year, the apartment investors that have an 800 million to a billion dollar portfolio, to the software company that's doing whatever he's doing, all of that translates through to the individual I'm working with, so that they know what's working out there right now, what strategies, what techniques, what marketing methods, and there is no secret method, there is no secret list, there is no secret anything. What there is is discipline, consistency, knowing your numbers, finding a niche, getting it going, automate it, systemize it, grow it, scale it before you do anything else. Focus is 100% of the game. Pick something. Let's pick something. Let's go with it. Let's grow it, scale it, automate it, and then you know expand from there. Yeah, I love it, man. I just think like the ability to look across all those different businesses and all those different experiences, I think that's really unique in this space. And uh, I think that's awesome. So if, if people want to come and check you out, how can they find out more about what you do and and look up everything there is to know about you? Yeah, so gregdickerson.com, all my information's on there, contact info, social media profiles, YouTube and Facebook and everything. So gregdickerson.com, it's got all my information there and I'm I mean I'm the other thing is I'm in it. So I'm developing, I'm doing single family, I'm flipping, you know, I'm developing properties, I'm doing multifamily, so I'm in it every day just like my clients are. And I'm always looking for business opportunities as well, you know, that I, I get into. I do equity capital and I look for companies that have the ability to scale and I'll come in as the intellectual capital. I can raise capital as well, you know, if, if it's, you know, required and appropriate for the, for the business that we're looking at and needed. And, uh, you know, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm in it in the trenches doing what I'm telling other people to do all day, every day. Awesome. Yeah. So everybody, in case you're listening to this, I'll put some links to Greg's stuff in the show notes as well, which you can get to at adwordsnerds.com slash podcast. Greg, thank you so much, man. This was super fascinating and awesome. And uh, I had a great time. And I really appreciate uh, you taking the time and talking to me and the REI Marketing Nerds uh, folks. It's awesome, dude. Thanks so much. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. It was a lot of fun. All right. Cheers, man. Have a great rest of your day. Yep. You as well. All right, everybody. That was it for our interview this week. I hope you had a great time. I really did. I really uh, was really interested in Greg's approach. And um, talking to him really made me want to sit down and get back into my own numbers. So I hope it did the same to you. As always, if you are not in our free Facebook group, I don't know what's wrong with you. At this point, I've said to you so many times, uh, it's really on you. You should totally get in there. It's the REI Marketing Nerds Facebook group. You can find us by going on Facebook and just typing in REI Marketing Nerds, or you can go to adwordsnerds.com slash group. That's A-D-W-O-R-D-S nerds.com slash group. It's totally free. I'm in there posting every single day, posting awesome stuff. We do free trainings, Facebook Lives, all sorts of cool stuff. So make sure you get in there and uh, 
Thank you, as always. If you are enjoying this podcast, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you listening, and I will see you next week. Till then, have a great rest of your day, and I'll talk to you soon. This is the podcastfactory.com. 